Hi everyone! Welcome to another episode of the Caduzzi Cast, and I have to say, the person I have on today is one of the most lovely human beings I have ever met. I, and you know why I say that? Because she says yes all the time. She's so generous. <laughs> How do you want me, everybody? Hi! How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so, Heidi, I know Heidi from Boston. Mm-hmm. I met you at a Dropkick Murphy's fundraiser for the Collada Fund, right? Yeah. Where we had to do the bartending. Yes. Right? I'm a terrible bartender. No, you were great. They love you up there. Because <laughs> you used to be the Red Sox girl, right? I was. They yes. love you up there. It's, you know what? It, that city is so great. And it was so much fun to be the Red Sox reporter because people in Boston have so much passion for the Red Sox. So it's, it's kind of a big deal there. It's fun. They have passion for everything up there. Yeah, that's true. Right? Now, I guess we should mention what happened with the marathon since this is going to go up next week and mm-hmm. we are Boston girls. Pretty yeah. sad. So we're sending out a lot of love to everybody up there. Absolutely devastating there. It's so sad that someone would attack something like Patriots Day and something like the Boston Marathon, which is such an institution there. Just, I have been heartbroken just watching all the coverage of it and, and my heart goes out to everyone in Boston and everyone affected. I know, and I was, I didn't even, for two days, I didn't even say anything, because I'm like, too sad. Yeah. What can you say, like on Twitter or something, I mean? Yeah. I retweeted them singing at the Bruins last night, that was just... That was beautiful. That, to me, is like what spirit and people, like, they they just took over and started singing. Yeah. And Renee let them. But God, ugh. I mean, my the, the kid that Martin... Richard, he's, his mom was from my neighborhood, and she went to school with my younger brother and Mike mm-hmm. McCogan mm-hmm. from the Street Dogs and just all of them. And the poor kid from the Chinese kid, the, the three of them, yeah. the girl from Medford. The Chinese student and, and, yeah, and that girl, Crystal. Just, and not only the three victims who died, but all the people who, who lost a limb, who lost a leg. Uh, Martin's little six-year-old sister lost her leg. Mm -hmm. Six years old. She's going to have to go through her entire life without a leg. I mean, just, it's so devastating. And it's, that street is, I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. McGreevy's is right there. That's where we're bartending and all the bars and restaurants. And and it's so much fun and so beautiful down there. And and it's just, it's forever changed. Mm -hmm. But, uh, But it also is showing just the resiliency and the spirit of the folks in Boston everyone coming together, and, and I'm sure the Patriots Day next year is just going to be amazing and it's such a wonderful tribute to those who were affected. They make me proud to be from Boston. Yeah. The one thing I always say, I'm like, people, I still have my accent. Like, I'm in movies <laughs> and on TV, and, and I just keep my accent because it's like such pride of growing up in such a place that, I, yeah, they keep saying tough, but tough to me, strong. I'd rather say strong. They're saying Boston strong. I like that better than tough because... Yeah. It's hard to manage the emotions. Everybody's really mad right now, too. So, I don't know. We're sending out a big shout-out to everybody out there. We're powerless. We don't even... Almost like speechless. There's nothing. Yeah. Just sending love. Okay. So, Heidi, let's start from the beginning. Where were you born? Fresno, California. Fresno. So you're a California girl. I am a California girl, but not the, the beach, Southern California kind of thing. Fresno's like... Kind of a small town. It, it's not. It's not that small in size. It's like six hundred thousand people, but it's it's very much an agriculture town and very much like feels like Mayberry. I grew up in suburbia. But oh yeah, it was fun. Very blessed. Great family. I have. I'm one of four kids, mm-hmm. and me and my brother and sisters were all tight. And oh yeah, one brother and two sisters. Two brothers, one sister. Okay. Um, and and my parents are great. My dad's a golf coach. My mom stayed home all my whole life and, and takes care of all of us, so it's great. Oh yeah, that does sound like Mayberry. Very much. <laughs> I was such a sheltered child. You were? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so first of all let's start off by we we'll go back to where you come from, but we're in New York City right now in Heidi's apartment and you're working here. I'm at MLB Network. MLB yes. Network, and the name of the show that you're working on now. Is... I host Quick Pitch, which airs seven days a week. Oh. I'm, I'm the host Monday through Friday. They do give me a break oh, every now and then. <laughs> and Alana Rizzo and Sam Ryan take care of the weekends, um, and they're wonderful. And I have got to say, I've worked at a lot of places. MLB Network is such a wonderful place. It's not only heaven if you're a baseball fan because all the great studios and you're just nonstop talking about baseball, watching baseball, all the stats and facts and and you've got Hall of Famers coming in the building that you can talk with on a daily basis. It's just, 
that's amazing enough, but the people that work there are so great, so supportive. It's, it's been the, the greatest experience for me since I started in January. Oh, that's great. I like to hear that because sometimes people are like, ooh, they, sometimes even when people have a good experience, they still complain. And that's hard for me to do. I haven't had anybody on the Caduzzi cast doing that, but on the side, I, when I talk to people, I'm like, really? Yeah. Are you really going to complain? You're so positive. So. I am. I like to <laughs> bring out the, the Even with good like, vibes. what happened with the marathon, like as sad as I am, I'm like, there's gonna, I'm going to be able to do, I'll do something. I'll be able yeah. to like somehow, because even the kid, people who lost their limbs, there's so many stories. My brother Jimmy is in a wheelchair and he changed his life and just, like my niece and nephew were down this weekend and I was joking with them because I was talking too much. Mm-hmm. And so I did the hand signal for um, uh, enough of this, a little yeah. more of this with the walking. And so I said, tell Jimmy that, because my brother always makes fun of me because I talk so much. And they said, oh, but Uncle Jimmy can't do that with his hands. And I said, oh, well, he doesn't get upset. You don't have to not do things because he can't do it. He'll yeah. still laugh. And uh, it, I was telling them about how, after his accident, how he, put, how he changed and how he's almost even more mature and more open yeah. and more, like, responsible than he was beforehand. So... Yeah. There are stories where, you know, so many people were like, oh, your son, he's got paralyzed. And my father, my father's like, I watched my, you know, the, the Red Sox win. That's, it's funny because that's what he refers to. I watched the Red Sox win the World Series with my son. He didn't die. Yeah. So there is something to be said about. That is true. And that I remember true. when and he. People coming together and just being so strong. Well, that's what the doctor said about the people in the marathon, that they were so happy to be alive. And it reminded me of the time Jimmy, because he died like three times on the, on the site. And, uh. I remember the euphoria I saw him in the hospital. He really did have like this amazing glow, like this one when he realized that he was alive. It was like crazy to see. Right. Yeah. So there wow. is something about the human spirit that keeps going. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and I am positive, and I like to hear about the positive because you could either talk about the positive or the negative, right? And that doesn't mean you can't get mad and be sad and everything. Absolutely. There's there's so many things in this world that can upset you or hurt you or, but. If you dwell on the negative, you're just going to be an unhappy person. Forever, and you could live forever being miserable. Right, right. And I really, really believe that you can control your life by controlling your mood and controlling your energy. And if you have positive energy, then you're going to have positive people around you, and you're going to make people happier. And if you're you're constantly negative or complaining about things or finding the worst in things, then people around, aren't going to want to be around you, first of all. But it's just going to be sad, so... I'm but you live out. it, because you've helped me... How many times? You helped me come down on the... Oh, I was on the field at the Red Sox <laughs> the, when I was doing my show. You, mm. you were like, Sue, come on, I'll put you on in the... In the uh, which inning was it that I got to... Whatever the break was, the eighth inning break? Yes. Somewhere. I don't know what it was, but you let me go on the TV and promote my show. <laughs> and then you showed up when I did Frank Baker. He ran for city council, and you and that LB showed up. But it was so nice. Like, you just say yes. So that's why you're here. Even I asked you, I said, will you do my Caduceus cast? He's like, yes, you have to go to work. You work till like 5 in the morning. You're like, yes, I'll do it. <laughs> did yeah, your parents bring so. you up like that? Is that how your whole family is? Well, I, you know, if I can help someone out I, or do whatever. I mean, uh, any, anything you've ever asked me to do only costs a little time. I know, but I think bad. people who are like you don't realize that how generous it is. Because oh. there's a lot of people that... That don't say yes. Well, I think it's because they're worried about themselves. They're very self-centered, which is fear. Oh. They usually don't... They're not the happiest people. I find the most generous people are the happiest people. Duh! <laughs> you know what? It, it, makes, it makes me happy, and this sounds cheesy, whatever. Don't believe me. Believe me, whatever. <laughs> but it makes me happy to make other people happy. You know? Mm-hmm. I, I think that sharing joy and sharing... Whatever you have to make other people happy is what will truly make you happy. Being self-centered and focusing on just making yourself happy is not going to make you happy. No, it actually makes you get away from the thing that you actually want the most, which is attention. Psychology 101 with Sue and Heidi. No, I think it's funny that you said as cheesy as it sounds. Because you always have to preface that because we're always nervous that somebody's going to be like... Oh, listen to Paul Ian. I make fun of you, right? But I was watching this movie where this guy was studying happiness. And he said, because I always try to like find the basic, break it down to like, and he's studying happiness and he said, well, they study depression all the time. Why can't I study happiness? And I was like, yeah, why? Why do we have to be so nervous and embarrassed that we're positive? Right, right. (laughs) I guess because the positive people don't beat up on the depressive people, but maybe the angry people beat up on the positive people. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. 
absolutely right. People who are unhappy want to bring people yes, down to their it's level. It's really funny, but the happy people, they don't always say, like, what are you depressed for? Right? right? We just kind of try to, like, give them a hug or something. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty funny. Okay, so I, I want to find out how you got into, so you went to grandma school in Fresno. Yep, born and raised in Fresno. Um, I was I was somewhat athletic uh, throughout high school and everything. Ran track. I was a cheerleader, gymnastics team, diving team, all the, um, you know, just very involved. Uh, when I went to college, I had an academic scholarship. I didn't. I stopped doing sports. Um, so you were smart. Yeah, I like to say I'm smart. Okay, smart, pretty, and <laughs> knows all about sports. Oh my god, I can't believe the guys on downstairs like knocking down the doors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, they probably get intimidated. Okay, oh, like wait a minute, it's too much. Oh, I'm not remotely intimidated. Yes, but, um, <laughs> so when I was in college, uh, I actually wanted to be an actress. You did? All growing up, I did theater plays. I mean, since I since I can remember, since five years old, church plays, school plays, everything. And I had an academic scholarship to school, so my parents said, you're going to go to school and get your $150,000 education because you've got a scholarship and that's what you got to do. You can do whatever you want after college. Where did you go to college? University of San Diego. It's a, a Catholic school in San Diego. Beautiful school. Uh, when I was in college... All of my guy friends who I'd sit and watch football with on the weekends or watch whatever sporting event with, they're like, you should be one of those sideline chicks. You'd be good at that. You know what you're talking about. And, you know, why don't you do that? And, and I thought, gosh, I really do love sports. I didn't realize how much I love sports until I went to college. Like, I just, it, it's just a part of my growing up, a part of who I am. I always mm -hmm. was watching my brother, watching my sister, watching sports on TV. My dad's a golf coach, so we were at Fresno State football games and basketball games. I grew up a big fan of Fresno State. I'm still, even though I went to the University of San Diego, still, I, I still am a bulldog red. That's like me. I live in New York, and I'm still a Celtics fan and a Patriots <laughs> fan. Everybody's like, Sue, how could you be? I'm like, I couldn't go back. Right. I couldn't be. It's your childhood. Yeah. It's what you've got from, yeah. from, from growing up, which is, I think those allegiances are stronger than anything you can forge later in life. But, um, so, so my, it didn't hit you till college. Like, that's what's always fascinating to me is like, yeah. You loved the sports, but you weren't conscious of it until... But I didn't think, like, I'm going to be a sports reporter. I, I, I guess I didn't, I didn't just think that, that was, like, a career path for me as Well, it wasn't so much for women either, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was literally, like, a junior in college or a senior in college when people said this to me. So I went and started interning at the NBC affiliate in San Diego to see if it was a good fit, and I loved it. Loved it. And... There's a photographer, Dave, uh, at the NBC affiliate, and I'm not sure if he's still there. I should reach out to him, but he kind of took me under his wing, and he, he made me get out there and do stand-ups and do interviews and all that stuff. That's that what I, I want to find out. too when afraid I, to do. When I was coming here, I was like, the one thing I want to ask her is, do you remember the first time you interviewed someone and what it was like? Like, what? Oh, my gosh. So scary. Bruce Bochy, who's got, like, <laughs> one of the largest heads on the planet. And, <laughs> and he's... Now I know him, and he's the nicest guy. But at the time, when I'm a 21-year-old college student who's never done this before, who's just trying to see if this is a business that I could do, and I'm walking on the field, at, uh, at that's when the Padres still played at Qualcomm Stadium. And I'm walking on the field, and you know, I've got this manager I've got to interview. Him. And Xavier Nady, I had those two the first day. And I was so nervous, and Bochi was so nice. Five, about five years later, I was working in Fresno, and he came to Fresno for an event. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, I just have to tell you, he said, you were one of the first people I interviewed when I got into this business and I was so nervous, but you were so nice and gracious about it. And I'm sure I looked and sounded like a 21 year old idiot on the field, but you were so nice and that really helped me in this career. He said, if you had been mean to me, I probably would have gone home crying and never come back. And the two of us have been friendly since. Because he said that meant so much to him. I was just going to say that speaks would tell to him. your character. That's what I mean about you. Other people could have just done it and gone on or been too embarrassed or too self-involved. And for you to be generous to give that to him. And he said it meant a lot to him. Of course it he does. Said, yeah. So what if he's a coach and he has a big head like and everybody... <laughs> it's like... Well, you know, people people tell you all the time, oh, you're great. You're a great coach or you're great... Well, I mean, yeah. whatever compliments he gets. But, but I, I think it's important to tell people that... that who they are as a person and the kindness they showed to you at, at one point, whatever, made a difference. Because I think, I mean, to me, when somebody tells me that I did something nice for them, 
that means so much more to me than someone saying, oh, you're hot. Right. Whatever. You know? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because the hot is like a physicality thing, and the other thing is that right. you actually affect, that, that people see you. When they call you hot, they don't necessarily see you. When you it's affect like, thanks to mom and dad. <laughs> right. Right. Way to go. <laughs> well, people used to say to me, do you want to be respected for the way you think and not the way you look? And I'd be like, well... Now I say, well, we should be respected for both. But I, but yeah. then I was like, well, I would never hang my my life on my looks because that would be right. That's going to go away. So you might as well right. guarantee looks that. Fade. And <laughs> not only do looks fade, but everyone has a different opinion of what is yes. beautiful. Mm-hmm. I totally. The yes. same, well, one person that I think can be phenomenally gorgeous, someone else is like, eh. Yeah. So beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And, and the family. That's all superficial and whatever anyway. And I don't control over what I look like. I mean... I can choose to put makeup on and brush my hair in a day. <laughs> that, that might that affect it a little bit. But anyway, so that's how I um, I got into the business and just what made me fall in love with it was was working in San Diego and and working with Dave. Who and that's another thing. I because of the kindness that Dave showed me and that he was able to to really push me to get out there and, and get a tape together. And I got hired right out of college. I've been so blessed. That anytime anyone comes to me and wants advice or help or wants a mentor in this business or anything, like I make sure to make myself available. You're gonna make me cry. Most important thing. No, you're gonna make me cry (laughs) because like, is that helping other people, passing it down? You can't forget not only where everyone says you can't forget where you came from, but you can't forget the people that helped you along the way. Because the truth of the matter is, really, like if he did say, if he did treat you like so, because he could have, his ego could have gotten in the way and Mm -hmm. thought like, I'm not talking to this 21 year old new girl, Right. right? I'm sure I, I I don't remember what was said at the time, but I probably stumbled over something or might have said something stupid or silly or whatever. And he was gracious about it. If he had had worn me out or made fun of me, or I've seen I've seen managers and coaches and people in this business who will take a rookie and if a rookie says a, a quote unquote stupid question or whatever, they'll wear him out. Mm-hmm. And if Bochi had done that to me, I probably would not be in this business today. Because you were so vulnerable. Now, since then, I've developed some tough skin. Right, right, right. But at that moment, you were but really vulnerable. Yeah. Was, was the do I do this or do I not? And and his his kindness really uh, propelled me into this business. So. And Dave was a great mentor, and he told you to do it, and he got behind you. Yeah, he was great. He's awesome. We all and need then, somebody to believe in us. Absolutely. And, I mean, nobody knows what to do or how to do things until you actually go out there and try it. And that's the thing. Like, every, like I, I say to, to people who come and ask me, oh, how would you get on TV in Boston? It's a dream job. Said, you know what? I went to a small town first. And that's what I recommend. Because if you ever saw the video of my first day on live mm-hmm. television, I probably look like an idiot. Mm-hmm. Everyone starts out. You don't, I mean, you know, you don't yeah. look into a camera and start talking right. and, and are completely comfortable right. and look like Katie Couric. <laughs> right. Even Katie Couric started somewhere yeah. looking wide-eyed and not knowing what she's doing. So I was blessed in that my hometown is Fresno, which mm-hmm. is a market about 55. They fluctuate, but uh, there's 220 markets. 220 is like probably in Montana somewhere, some small town. And one is New York. So, um, the higher you go, the bigger the market. So Fresno is a pretty big market to start out in, but because I was from there and because it's got that small town feel, I, I mean, literally one of my best friends in high school, her dad's the mayor of the town. Right. And you know, I knew all the football coaches <laughs> and, the bat- and like I knew everyone in town cause it's got a small town feel. So I was hired in my hometown and I worked there for five years. Um, that was my first on air job out of college, but I wanted to do sports. And they offered me a job on the morning show doing traffic and weather. Like it's like a movie. Right. Right? So it was <laughs> it was kinda of one of those things. I could go to Amarillo, Texas and be the weekend sports anchor there. Or I could go to my hometown, Fresno, and and start on this morning show. And they knew I wanted to do sports, so I could maybe eventually work my way into sports. So that's what I did. And uh I woke up at 2.15 in the morning to go to work. 22 years old, mind you, just fresh out of college, and I'm going to work at 2.15 in the morning. And I had to, I had to, the show was live from 5 to 10. And at the time it started, it was 5 to 9. Now it's 5 to 10. And I was literally every 10, 15 minutes doing traffic and, and sometimes weather. We had another guy who sometimes did the weather too. Um, and in Fresno, California, where there's, you know, no traffic and it's pretty much mild weather. <laughs> so I'm like, yep. And literally I would be like, there's a cow on the road on Avenue 12, so just be careful. Make sure you don't hit the cow. 
There you go. Have a nice day. I mean, really. But during that time, since there wasn't a lot, oh, you must have developed a little bit of your own persona. The greatest part about that is morning show, live, and traffic and weather are both unscripted. Mm -hmm. So I was up there talking, Mm ad-libbing, on live TV every 10 to 15 minutes for five hours a day. Which is a muscle. So you grow so much faster. If I had gone and done the weekend sports in Amarillo, Texas, I would have had one two-minute sports cast on Saturday and one on Sunday and then maybe a 30 second hit the rest of the days of the week and I wouldn't have developed my on-air presence as quickly as I was able to in Fresno and I got to be home and then eventually the about a year and a half after I got there the weekend sports anchor left I moved into his chair that's another funny story I want to hear weekend sports anchor <laughs> left he went to uh, Salt Lake City and uh, so he he told me because everybody there knew I'm a sports junkie I want to do sports He had told me, hey, i just given you a heads up. I gave them my notice. I'm leaving in a month to go work in Salt Lake City. So I marched myself into the news director's office and I said, you knew I came here. I want to do sports. I want this job. And he said to me, well, you know, I know you told me that, but I don't think Fresno is ready for a female sportscaster. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? You had, he, I had thought he gave me the indication if a job in sports opened up, I'd be able to move into it. But Whatever. So for six months, I worked Monday through Friday. I came in on Saturday. I put together a sports cast. I sat on the desk. I read it. The directors, obviously, I knew everyone there. Delivered my sports cast. I went into his office Monday morning. I handed him the tape. I said, here's my sports cast for the weekend. For six months. Did this every weekend. And he finally, I think, just couldn't find anyone willing to do the job for the little amount he was willing to pay them. (laughs) And said, all right, fine. You can have the job. All right. I have goosebumps right now. Because I don't know if people understand, like, what goes into... How hard you work. Yes, how hard you work. And and the humility that... It takes a lot of humility. I mean, some people are flashing the pans and they can get things done quick, but they usually burn out if they don't have... Exactly. Right? If your star shoots up really high, really fast, like... I have people who say, oh, you know, I know you tell me to go to a small town, but I have this opportunity to do some webcasts for ESPN Boston. I have this girl. Um, I wanted, I'm going to do webcasts for, I'm not going to say the real website, but let's right. just say ESPN Boston. It was a right. significant website. And I said, good for you. That's awesome that you got that opportunity. I said, you know, I always say you should go cut your teeth in a smaller market because you can make the mistakes there and people are more forgiving. So what happened? She did her first webcast. She... Looked at it online, read the comments underneath saying, she's an idiot, she's terrible. Because you're green. Right. You need that experience. And you look like a deer in headlight the first time you go on camera. Everybody does. And she was eaten alive. And she literally, I met her for coffee, and she was in tears saying that she thinks she's going to quit the business because she can't handle all the negative criticism. And I'm like, that's why. Yeah, when I went to Fresno, I'm sure there were people that were mocking me or making fun of me or whatever but in a market like fresno a smaller market one they kind of expect people to be a little green right so they're more forgiving and there's not the kind of forums that in the bigger markets the blogs and the whatever and the comments that people have to make to mock their sportscasters or their whoever and so i was somewhat sheltered being in the fresno market yeah i you know i got comments every now and then or emails or whatever people telling you doing a horrible job or a great job or whatever But then by the time I got to Boston, and I was really highly criticized, (laughs) because people just feel like they want to share their opinion all the time. No, the Bostonians, (laughs) I don't care. I'm from Boston. I love them. But let me tell you something. I've never seen anything more horrific than the track gals comment. (laughs) Boston, those people, I'm like, I haven't said to them. I'm like, how do you guys even do it? They're like, Sue, sometimes we have to even like... Like, not even look because it's so bad. I think one of them said they had to go to therapy or something. I don't know. They're probably oh, joking. God. but I know. Just you too know. mean. Like, you know what? People, so and it's just, some people take, like, joy out of just bringing people down or whatever. Well, and it's usually but, only on the comments. If they really yeah. met you or anything, I always find... I mean, I used to... If I ever got caught talking about somebody, like, when I was a teenager or something, I'm not usually a talk about... But if, say, I did, I caught up in the moment with another yeah. girl wanting her to like me, so I talked about somebody. If the person I was talking about ever came up to me and said that to me, I would be... You'd never say it to someone's face. No, and I would right. be devastated. I would be like, yeah. you know what? I really didn't even mean it. Yeah. I'm a jerk. What do they call them? Like keyboard warriors yeah, or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that? I mean, just... But yeah, also, don't so. you think if people start... Once you got to Boston, once you have that hard work under your belt and you've done... You've taken risks, like gone yeah. and, sp- and, and done your first interview and, and did what you did to get the, the sports casting job in Fresno, 
easy. It's easier to handle because you're like, whatever. I work right. my butt off. You've been through right? things and you've yeah, you've worked hard and you've improved and you've got so much. I had five and a half years in this business under my belt before I went to Boston. I know people think I just showed up in New England out of nowhere. But they but... think everybody shows up. Like, <laughs> Smack Marin has his portraits. Right. What the fuck? He's been like doing stand up for like 20 years. Yeah. And they're like, oh, he's an overnight success. It's like, no. Right. <laughs> People no. aren't. People don't know how much hard work goes into it. And even with the Red Sox job, Don, Jerry, and I used to joke that people think we show up at like 6.55 and just do the game. But we would – you're not only traveling with the team. So, But, I mean, a typical day, I'd wake up. I have game notes from – from the Red Sox, they send out all the clips that I've got to read. I've got emails from all my producers, pre-game show, in-game show, post-game show. You're, you're talking with people constantly throughout the morning while you're trying to get a workout in or have breakfast or whatever you're doing. You get to the field at like 2, 3 Plus, you have to have a workout and eat breakfast so you look good. <laughs> and I mean, come on. Goodness, you gain an ounce and they write five blogs about it. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Oh, my God. Look at that girl. Anyway, um, oh. so, yeah, you do all that and then... You get to the field at 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Not to mention the, like, two hours that go into, like, putting yourself together to look nice on television. But right. uh, you get to the field, and, and you're, you're doing interviews and, and going from one clubhouse to the next, trying to get everything that they need you to get for the pregame show. You've got meetings with the managers. You're going over notes. I mean, I would literally at the field be running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And it's a lot of waiting, too, waiting for the player you need to get an interview with or whatever. But... It's, it's a lot more work than people think. So, um, Well, I saw you at the Yankees game, the Yankees-Red Sox game, and it was a yeah. rain delay. How long? Like a two-hour rain delay. And then I was like, Heidi, yeah, what? Those things. <laughs> what? <laughs> then we have those things. Well, I was like, well, what happens now? You guys had to go to Canada or something the next day, and you, you, you described the whole schedule. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Everybody's so the game exhausted. ends, and then, yeah, an hour after the game ends, we get on a bus and go to the airport and fly to the next city and get in at 5, 6 in the morning and get a couple hours of sleep and do it all over again. Yeah. But you know what? If you love it's it. It's hard work, and it's a lot of hours, and it's a lot more work than people think. That is the biggest thing. that I, I had coffee with Jenny Dell last week, and she's like, oh, people don't realize how much work. She's like, I didn't realize until I started doing it. But it's so rewarding, too, because I've, gotten, I've gone to all but two of the major league ballparks, St. Louis and Milwaukee. I'm coming for you. And um, I've gotten to see some great cities. I've gotten to do the fish tossing in Seattle. I've gotten to... To climb the CN Tower in Toronto, I've gotten to uh, Tropicana Field. I got to go out actually on top of the dome, through the center of the roof. I mean, that was really cool. But I've gone to so many great cities and experienced so many great things. I got to cover the World Baseball Classic for MLB Network this year. That was such an experience because the crowds, the Dominican and Puerto Rican crowds that were in Miami were so oh, yeah. crazy and fun. They're beating drums and they're playing all these instruments and it just like felt like a carnival. It was awesome. So I've, I've been so blessed to do so many great things because of this business. But it is hard work. But it's fun. It's fun. I mean, I But know. I think the hard work is what gives you, like, the self-esteem. If, like, you talked about the girl who just went fast. Like, she doesn't have the innards to be able to sustain. Because you do have to sustain. You have to sustain people talking shit about you. You have to sustain yeah. them loving you. You don't want them to love you too much. You can't feed into either one of them. Because even right. if they love you too much, you like... You don't want to feed into that either. You just want to hold on to your humanity. And I always believe that, like, if you keep working, it keeps you grounded and keeps you right. somewhat humble that you... Yeah. I mean, for the show I'm doing now, I absolutely love the show. But I'm on at 1 a.m. Normal, a normal night, it starts at 1 a.m. And it actually airs all night and all morning until about noon Eastern. But I go in at, at 5 or 6 in the evening for a 1 a.m. show. And we sit, I sit there and write every single one of those on-camera intros, all of the, the teases, probables, all of that stuff. I mean, it's an hour show. And I sit there and I've got a wonderful producer and a, a, a coordinating producer that, that are helping me and working with me. And we have a researcher. He's, he's great. If I, I mean, the greatest thing. I, I did a Barry Zito thing the other day and I said, what percentage of uh, fastballs do you throw in this outing? Because he's been known to, he's... As he's getting older, his velocity on his fastball is decreasing, and mm -hmm. so he's throwing less fastballs, and he's that has actually been successful for him. So he was like 50% fastballs last year, and then he went down to like 37% average. And so, anyway, point is, I just asked Andy, I'm like, hey, Andy, I want this stat, and he goes and he gets it for me, and he comes back, and he's like, well, here, da 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 so it's the greatest thing. So I'm writing all of this stuff, but I've got this great team of, of people that I'm working with. And we sit there 
the entire time from six till one, and we're keeping an eye on all the games. But we're not sitting there watching games with popcorn and beer and right. hot dogs. <laughs> we're you can't miss a trick, right? You can't miss yeah. anything. We're writing. We're looking up stats. We see Jason Giambi hit a home run at forty-two years old. We're like, what's the oldest player to ever hit a home run? Okay, it's Julio Franco. <clears throat> all right, we're gonna put that in the show. Like. We're trying to come up with everything that the, the baseball fan would want to hear in their broadcast. And we've got the great, these great minds that are behind me helping me out with it. And I'm translating it into scripts on paper. But it's um, to put that show together that airs from 1 a.m. until about noon Eastern is a lot of work. And it requires a great team. And it's a lot of fun, though. It's but you're crafting but I don't exactly get out there. what goes on there. It's like writing a TV show. You're crafting what they hear. You're, right. It's your vision that they're... And trying to be fun and creative with yes. it. But I don't get up there and just read something somebody else wrote. That's the point. Right. I don't get up there and just kind of like, okay, I'm just going to read off the prompter. I write it. See, this is why I like to do the Caduzzi cast, because you find out stuff about people. Like when I did C.J. Watson from the Nets, mm -hmm. he started a foundation. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Sue, I had no idea how hard... This would be. He just thought he's C.J. Watson. He was on the Bulls. He was on. He's on the yeah. Nets. He he's put the same out there. People yes. throw money. At it. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, "Oh my gosh!" But yeah, once again, another guy works his butt off. Yeah. You know, even when he was like, with the Nets, he tweeted at me that he's got to work on. He texted me that he's got to work on his hoops or something. And I yeah. was like, even him, he's still work. They have to work. Oh, yeah. People have to work all the time. And it's funny because it's easy to be jealous. Because then you don't have to do the work. Like, people who are like, oh, I'm jealous. It's like, well, just because you don't want to do the work. Or maybe they... I yeah. mean, I think everybody has a talent for something. Right. Absolutely. But but you're right. There's a lot of people who are like, oh, I could do her job in a heartbeat. And maybe they could. And and they probably could. But they don't realize that I don't just get up there and read off a prompter. That they don't, that we're right? writing it. That we're I don't know if I knew that you didn't. Coming up with all the stuff. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> no. And that's cool to find out because that's probably your education and how you got to... Uh, scholarship for how smart you were, so that probably adds. Yeah, yeah. Someone else who might probably be good helps. on camera, might, <laughs> yeah, they might not be able to write. So then they, right. that's part of the reason why they give you the job too, because you can write and be on camera. And there right? are people like that. I know uh, one of my dear friends, bless her heart, she is beautiful, well spoken. She comes across so well on camera, but she can't write her own stuff. And I bet you she wishes she could, because she'd and, have more control and be able to handle it. And right? she'd be she'd be in the business uh, more, I think. Mm -hmm. Because when somebody else has to, to write for you, then they're not going to use you as much. Because uh, if you can think on your feet and come up with your own thing. You know, if we were like with the Red Sox, when I first started, they didn't know what they were going to get from me. So they worked me in slowly. And by the time I was out of there, we if it started raining, they'd stick me up in the booth with a microphone and say, talk. Right. Because I can handle it. And, and that was some of the funnest times I had. But see, that's we don't like rain delays, but I like sitting there with Nick Cafardo and just talking about what's going on. But that you got that skill from doing the weather and the uh, right. traffic from having to fill the time. Yeah. People don't understand that there's like, even with stand-up, like people are like, you make it look like it's, you know, like you're right. doing it in the moment up there. And I'm like, yeah, that took 20 years. Right. Right. It takes and 20 all of years your life to be experience that and all of your everything you're doing to sit down there and and come up with that stuff. And I, humbling. See, you're you're much more witty and and <laughs> funny than I could ever try to be. But uh, I like to, this is when my funniness I have to say for my own compliment. When my funniness comes out the most is when I listen to others, which brings us back to the generosity thing. Mm -hmm. I am the most funny when I'm not worried about being funny and when I'm not worried about uh being the only, like when I can sit back or when I let other people be funny off of me. That uh -huh. happens a lot too, like where the guys will go on a roll because of, but yeah. it's listening. There's a lot of listening that makes it, Yeah. which I'm sure with the interviewing, you have to listen a lot because you can't just bombard these people. And I think the people that are the best interviewers are the best listeners. You can go in with a list of three or five questions or whatever you're going to ask them and just say, okay, how did you feel out there on the mound? <laughs> Uh, what did you think about this play? You can ask a list of set questions and not listen for their responses and the interview will be fine. But the best interviews are the ones you see where the interviewer reacts from what they said and maybe asks the follow-up question or maybe moves on to the next one, but you know they're listening, you know? They have a human experience with people. Yeah. Because with stand-up for a while there, I used to be so... And this Boston did it to me a little bit like that. Rah, rah, rah. Always on guard, you know. Yeah. And uh, I would like just... I would try to... And in stand-up, a lot of it is they, they like a heckler or something. You attack them or whatever. And that's what I used to do. And then finally, I used to think, like, that doesn't make me feel better. And it's sending off a message to the audience who I'm not real. 
it's not really who I am. Yeah. It was coming yeah. from fear. So once I started to learn how to like, if somebody heckled me to be able to slow down uh-huh. and like smile uh-huh. and turn and talk to them a little bit more, sometimes they weren't being me. Sometimes they were just trying to be part of the show. Or sometimes to be funny. And some of them yeah. were funny. Like I remember I was on stage at the Com- Comedy Connection in Boston, packed. And the guy in the front row, I had the microphone. I go, where'd you get that sunburn? He goes, outside. And the crowd <laughs> laughed for like a good three minutes. It was hilarious. That's and I didn't good. jump on him and I didn't say, I gave it to him. I was like, I didn't expect him to say outside at all. For, and it was just hilarious. Right, right. That is pretty funny. So there's something about what we're talking about, about the generosity of spirit that helps the career in terms of being able to see other people. Yeah. Yeah. And doing a lot of, you writing all that stuff yourself is like, yeah, that's the other thing people, I don't think people get. It is a lot. You have to use your brain. There's a lot of... Um, and also, like, I don't always choose... I, I can have some input, obviously, on the show. I'm the one hosting it. But a lot of times I'll say, okay, we want you to do a piece on this. And it might be something I'm not that familiar with. Mm-hmm. And so I have to then go look up what the history is, what the whatever is. Because, I, you know, I don't know everything in baseball. You know, I'm sorry. People probably... Sorry to burst bur- the illusion there. <laughs> <laughs> people but, probably expect you to know everything yeah, and everything, and people right? do. They think yeah. I'm like a walking. I should be a walking baseball encyclopedia. <laughs> people think that you should just know every. You know, there's going to be a call up that I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, mm-hmm. and I, I I mess up. Thankfully, with uh, with my show, we have great staff, great researchers, great people on the show, and they'll they'll get in my ear and say, "You said that wrong. Let's fix it." And I was okay. going to say, "Do you have a thing in your ear?" When I do. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the weirdest thing. I was trying to say, like how talk while people it? are talking to you. <laughs> When did that start happening? Was that from the very get-go or? <coughs> yeah, sorry, I've got a cough. Um, from the beginning, I've always, just being on TV, you always have an IFB in your ear so people can talk to you. But when I was in Fresno, the t- the talking was very minimal. Right. <laughs> so I what mean, was the first time? They wouldn't stopped? talk to you while you're talking. <laughs> and then, so then I go to Fresno, or I go to, I go to Boston, and there's some instruction, but for the most part, they're talking to me when I'm off camera. Right. Um, or when we're in a soundbite or whatever. and But then sometimes they have to talk to you because there's something going on and they'll talk to you while you're talking and say, you know, dump out of this or wrap it up or whatever. Um, but it was still minimal. And then I started doing the rain delay coverage and, and they'd get in my ear a little more and say, um, say Nick Cafardo and I are talking about the Red Sox pitching staff and, and someone's in the truck and they've got a stat. Um, one of our associate producers is like, oh, uh, you know, John Lester, 3.03 ERA against the Rays in this situation or whatever. They'll jump in and give me a stat sometimes or or tell me like, hey, move on to the next topic or we've got video of John Lackey throwing, do that next. So that's when it started. But here, the studio show, I host the whole show. They're in my ear constantly. <laughs> And, and that was like, we did about, we did I think five rehearsals before we actually went live on air with the show. And the first one we did, I felt like I was on a runaway train and that I was going to walk off the set and they were going to be like, yeah, nice try. We're going to get someone else to do this. But that's the worst feeling that people don't understand that that happens too. Like, I don't know if this is what you're saying, but yeah. I've had moments in my career where I felt like my in- insides were going to fall out and I was like, I can't do this. I cannot right. do this. Yeah. And then you do it. Yeah. Right? Is that what happened? The first show I did, uh, it was a rehearsal, so it was off camera, but like there's... And, and getting the lingo of how they say things at MLB Network. I mean, there's things across the business, you know, SOTs and VOs and whatever that everybody knows. But they would say um, bump or cross roll or uh, live look in or, or I guess live look in is pretty easy. But they'd say different things in my ear and I'm like, what, is, what does cross roll mean? What are you talking about? And that's when if we've got a game in progress... And I'm doing highlights of what happened earlier in the game. They'll cross roll a play that just happened because it's coming from a different source. So they call it cross roll. They cross roll it from a different source. And this just happened moments ago. Home run puts the Dodgers ahead, blah, blah, blah. And what they're doing is telling me in my ear what's going on. Cross roll, Dodgers take the lead. Uh, Carl Crawford, home run off, you know, who at whatever pitcher. And so they're saying that in my ear and I'm saying it to the audience. And that, that took a little getting used oh to. Oh, my God. Can I tell you? I honestly can say I don't think I could ever do that because my eyes would be going crazy. It's, it, <laughs> that is, like, the biggest still. I mean, only a couple of weeks into doing the show here is the biggest adrenaline rush when we're, we're doing live look-ins and they're cross-rolling video in there. And I don't have the information on a sheet in front of me. Usually, when I, we go through the highlights, we have what's called a shot sheet. It's the person who edits the highlight 
gives me a sheet and it's got three columns and the first column says, you know, what inning we're in, you know, bottom first, two on, two out for Carl Crawford. And then it says the action grounds into a double play or whatever. And then it has the final score. Ending, ending, double play, blah, blah, blah. Well, I guess if there was two outs, it wouldn't be a double. Anyway, this is just an example. <laughs> so, uh, Don't hold it. Or, you know, hits a, hits a home run. So two were on base. So the the end result is three-run homer, and the Dodgers mm-hmm. take a three-nothing lead or whatever the score was before. So there's three columns, and I'm watching the video and reading off the sheet and kind of trying to tell people the action based on the information on the sheet. But then when we do cross-rolls or when we're doing a live look-in or where the game is just ending and we're going to, you know, go take you to the end. Then they're just getting in my ear and they're, they're giving me the situation, you know, um, Grant Belfour in for the save, uh, two outs facing, you know, uh, Joanna Suspedis. Uh, let's take a listen. And they just tell you in your ear and I'm telling the fan that's the, that's the weirdest part, but it's, I'm getting used to it and it's fun. See the comic in me is like, that would be a hilarious like role on a sitcom to have somebody do like, all that behind the scenes. Like I love making it three dimensional instead of like, Oh, yeah. here's Heidi on camera. Wouldn't that be fu- a funny show. It would be a hilarious show. To, because trying to If show people could hear yes. what was coming through my IFB and then also hear, like, you like have a split screen of what's going on in the control room and then what's going, like, a shot of me reading shot sheets and looking around, like, where are we going next? And uh, and then actually, like, a, a screen of what's going on air and how, it, how smooth it can look on air when behind the scenes it's like... Like, literally, sometimes I'm, like, throw my hands up in the air and I'm, I'm mouthing, where are we going next? <laughs> well, can see, this is what I like about it because I feel like... By by showing that, by humanizing it, by showing what really happens, it instead of people, it almost breaks the thing like people where people put people on a pedestal. It's like no, people. This is what how it goes on. It actually inspires people. Like oh, oh, okay. Everybody feels like they don't know what they're doing some of the time, and the difference yeah. between the people who make it and the people who don't are the people who keep going. Right. Even when they feel like they they're not going to make it, or when they don't know, or they ask questions. Like I find a lot of times, I when I don't know. Yeah. Saying you don't know and is important. The thing that helps, too, is I've got the greatest team behind me. Justin White is generally the producer for the show, and the two of us have great communication. I actually worked with him at Nesson, too, which is cool because I know him from beforehand. Okay. But And we've we've established that I just need to know where we're going next and tell me in one word, and I'm good to go. You know, Unless there's something that needs to be explained. But he'll say, you know, shot sheet, prompter, scoreboard, highlight, whatever. And, and I know where we're going because it's an hour show I don't memorize the rundown and things are constantly in a state of fluctuation anyway so um, so he's good at, at guiding me through the show in a way that he's not talking in my ear constantly or throwing me off or whatever all I'm thinking right now is this is excellent preparation for your husband <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Honey, one word. Yeah. One word, that's Tell all I need. Tell me where to go. Yeah, exactly. But, and, but the, the team is great, too. And they do so much behind the scenes that to make it look good and look smooth. And, and to, without them and without Andy or Moses, whoever our researcher is for the day, um, without those people feeding me that information. Because we'll say, okay, we're going to go take a live look in um, for this game. And I'll say, okay, can you, can you give me a stat from the game? And they'll say, oh, Coco Crisp was four for five with a home run, three RBI. So then I have some information to give the audience as opposed to just looking at the scoreboard and saying, Oakland wins seven to one. Yay for them. Next. But no. that's your talent. That's what you, in, from your gut, knows how to do and what, what makes you, you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, there has to be, it's channeling through you is what I'm getting, yeah. because I'm comparing it to writing a TV show or creating your own stuff. Like, that's what you, that's why they hired you, is because you're able to break it down, whatever your, however you see the sports, is it's channeling through yeah. your person. Yeah. And people don't get that either. Yeah. They think you're just standing there. Just reading. Other people do. <laughs> yeah, so it's like your college education, your smarts, all your, uh, your experience, the experience from the Fresno from having to talk that much that long. Right. Your humility from not going to the big market and staying there. Mm-hmm. Your tenacity, six months. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to take from that. I'm going to be like, well, what would Heidi do? Heidi would just keep going because there is something. It's like the, taking things personally, you can't. Most of the time people don't care. Most of the time they do have to hear it for six months until they get it. Yeah. Like I'm finding that with my one-woman show. Like, People are like, oh, it's really hard. They were telling me that when I first started to do it. And I'm like, yeah. oh, they were right. It is really hard. But 
it is so fulfilling to be able to break down like people oh we can't have a woman's sports guest oh yes you can yeah <laughs> so it makes I'll it easy you. right and it makes it easy when everybody else says all the other stuff yeah you're like whatever you know yeah. like you said about like what pretty like everybody has a different you'd start to just get to a point where you're like oh i can't listen to all that like whatever you'll think yeah. somebody's pretty some people don't it doesn't matter absolutely it matters absolutely. what you think you know my, I, i've so learned and this is you know in my in my wise old age of 31 <laughs> but you can only worry about what you control you can't really control what you look like you can't really control if everyone thinks you you look nice they like the dress they don't like the dress they right. think you should wear pants imagine? they think you should wear flats <laughs> that you know you're too tall you're too short you're too whatever can't control that part but what i can control is my performance and how much i prepare and how well i do on tv and even sometimes you screw up and it happens you know and you turn the page and you move on but the thing i can control is how hard i work and that's what, so that's what I focus on. I can't control the rest of it. And you can control, like, you went to L- you went to California and that you were supposed to work there and you didn't work there, you came here. Yeah. Like, people don't realize, like, some of the times that stuff happens, too. Like, sometimes yeah. I was supposed to be on... I, I talked to MLB Network before when I was still in Boston and... I think I, I remember you telling me at the Yankees game that you were talking to them. Yeah, and I, I really had decided that I needed to go home and be closer to my family. I missed my family tremendously. Loved what I did in Boston, but it's a lot of work and it's kind of a lonely experience for me because while people think... And it's funny to say lonely because mm-hmm. I'm around tons of people every day at a ballpark. But I... I can't hang out with the players. They're the players, you know, right. and there, there has to be that, that, that line. And I didn't know anyone in Boston when I got there, and I, I made some friends while I was there. But, you know, I'm traveling on the road with the team, and I've got my associate producer, Jim White, who's wonderful. And, and sometimes we go out after the game and, and get a drink just to wind down or get some food or whatever, and whoever the photographer was with us. But a lot of times it was go back to the room and shower and watch – TV and go to bed and because I mean you've got to do it the next day anyway but um, it was a lot of being by myself and that's what people don't realize they think I'm like going to games and going out and partying with all the players or something afterwards that's not the case but not only being by yourself but you're putting yourself out there constantly right. without a lot of criticized. nurture and a lot of not a lot of nurturing coming in on the other side yes exactly exactly and so it, it felt a little lonely, and I wanted to go back and be closer to my family, and I'm very close with them. So I took the job with uh, Time Warner Cable Sportsnet, and I was supposed to do the Lakers broadcasts, and, and then, you know what, it, it didn't end up being what I wanted it to be. It didn't make me happy. I missed baseball. And, uh, and I actually, I was on hold for the next Lakers season, so I never ended up doing any Lakers games. And what people don't know, I wasn't fired and nothing happened, nothing crazy happened. It just wasn't, it wasn't making me happy and I missed baseball. And I was, MLB Network offered me this job again and I realized it gave me an opportunity to go to a national network, bigger platform, and to get back into a sport that I loved and missed. And, and so that's why then, you know, time where I let me out of the contract and I came here and, and I still have a great relationship with them. In fact, I think they're going to be broadcasting Dodger games. And they said, if I ever wanted to come back there, the doors open. And, um, and of course people want to make it something that it isn't. So oh, I'll pissed off the Lakers or Why can't whatever. they say something nice? This is what I was talking about. People want there to be some sensational story about why I didn't do any Lakers games. And there's not, sorry to disappoint. No sensational not. story. I got fired from Murphy Brown. From now I realize it's because I think they forced me on her. Uh huh. It was like a network thing. It had nothing yeah. to do with me. Yeah. Right. I didn't know at the time. They literally, the rumor was that I brought my laundry to the set and told Candace to do my laundry. <laughs> and that's the weird thing. People come up with these stories and they're like, oh, is it true that you did this? And I'm like, what? No, no, it's not true. And you know what? I I still, I think the people at Time Warner are great. I, all the executives there were nothing but good to me. It just... It wasn't what I expected, and it wasn't it wasn't working out to make me happy. And they were kind enough to let me out of the contract so I can come here. But kudos to you to do that, to to take that risk too. It's like people don't realize like risks are involved and yeah. disappointments and making decisions that are. And, and part of it is you want you went home and saw your family and got like reduced too. So I did. It's like, I did. I had a year where I got to spend so much time with my family, and I did some LA Galaxy games, which was another 
big challenge for me because I had watched zero soccer games in my life. <laughs> zero. And they came to me and said, I have an idea for my next big We're going to have you do, we're going to have you do some, some LA Galaxy games. I'm like, what? Do you know when you hired me and you asked me what I know about soccer and I said zero? That was not me exaggerating. I know zero. And they're like, don't worry, we'll help you through it. I did a crash course in soccer. I thanked my sister's a volleyball coach at Fresno Pacific University. She set me up with their soccer coach, and he literally sat down and tutored me in the sport of soccer. Told me some books to read. I read some books, talked to coaches, talked to people, studied the roster, obviously, and they did. They helped me through it, and um, it was great. The PR person for the LA Galaxy, Justin Pearson, I would literally make him stand next to me on the field because I didn't want to screw this up. And he's got all the soccer knowledge. He's their PR person. So if I, I was ever confused about something that happened during the game or I needed a little clarification on a ruling or whatever, I had him right there. And I'm like, Justin, what does that mean? What, what just happened there? What are they doing in this? What's, you know, why are they shifting? Why are they subbing out this guy or whatever? And, um, and he would help me with that. And, and that was a, I, I mean, I, that was a cool experience for me because I was able to cover on live television a sport that a month before I never really paid attention to that much. But the whole time you're telling me this story, I'm like, see, it speaks to who you are. Instead, this is the difference between people who are successful and people who aren't. It begins with the generosity, but the generosity comes from the humility where you were like faced with a challenge. And instead of getting all ego and getting mad and scared, you said, I'm going to read with my brain read why <laughs> I got the, the educate, why I got the uh, scholarship. And you figured it out and you showed up. Like, I don't know if people understand that that's, how it goes down. It, it's interesting. I'm, I'm one of those cheesy people that love all the, like inspirational quotes and wisdom and guidance and whatever. And there's so many of them that say talent can only take you so far. Hard work is what really separates the cream of the crop. And that's the thing. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm the cream of the crop or whatever, but I'm saying when I am faced with something, I could have gone in there and said, no, I don't know anything about soccer. I'm not doing those games. Fear, ego. And I was hired to do Lakers. So they would have said, okay. But I said, you know what? I'm going to be a team player. I'll do it. I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need you to hold my hand, but I'll do it. And it was a great experience. I mean, they they won the cup. Right. They won this year. Oh, I remember you awesome. tweeting about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even... And I got to meet, you know, David Beckham and Robbie Keane and Landon Donovan and all these great soccer players and Kobe Jones, who was our analyst, greatest guy, and he's, you know was an amazing soccer player and, and got to experience some cool things. But that's on a personal level. You walk through a fear on your own. I find all the anecdotes, I mean, uh, accolades or whatever that people give you doesn't bring me that much joy because it kind of hits you and falls down. It doesn't mm -hmm. really go in. What goes in for me is when I challenge myself like that with what you did. Like mm -hmm. when I show up and I do something and I act, yeah. I don't choose fear and ego and I choose the other thing. Not only do I not choose fear and ego, I actually learn and it, expand my life from it and I create more relationships it makes me feel more grounded and more yeah and you grow as a person I'm, I'm all about experiencing things like I mean trying new things in my job and whatever but like just just doing I mean something people probably would be shocked to hear it when I was 12 years old I climbed Mount Whitney which is the highest mountain in the continental United States that's the kind of family I came from we were campers and hikers and whatever and I mean, or just going on a trip to Alaska and going whitewater rafting or going skydiving or I went to Australia and went bungee jumping, whatever. I'm all about experiencing new things because that's how you not only grow as a person, but just like you have a full and happy life to me is getting out and doing stuff, you know? Well, and you're speaking to me who's experienced it firsthand with you. You're not just telling me this <laughs> and I'm going to go home and be like, I don't know if she was telling the truth. You showed up for me like at Frank's thing. I mean, LB, Linda Bias and you. Yeah. Just show it up. And it really funny. helped. They needed it. He, well, let's tell them. So Frank Baker, I grew up with Frank. He ran for city council. He threw his name in the hat like right before the, the time, you know, the, the limit whenever you could, you know, yeah, the last deadline, night, the right. deadline. And uh, he was like the underdog and they didn't think he was going to do it. And we had the comedy show and you and LB, LB hosted, you showed up and it made everybody buy tickets. And not only did they make money, but the moral, the morale, like they were all really tired from doing All so much work. campaigning yeah, yeah. that they said that the morale from that night pushed him. That's great. And he became, he's a rep. That's awesome. I know. Isn't that exciting? Yeah, but that's what life is. That's it right there. You show up, yeah. you get something done. You And, and I'll be so generous. He gave my, uh, he got a picture of Gronk uh -huh. from my nephew. Uh -huh. My nephew is six. He's, he was five at the time. Yeah. 
I gave him the picture and it was autographed, you know, official Patriots. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like framed. I mean, mm-hmm. LB showed up, like showed up. And he gave it. And so I gave it to my nephew and he opened it. And he goes, oh, it's like Gronk, like jumping through the air, catching the ball. Right. And my nephew goes, oh. And then he goes, oh, come on. Somebody scribbled on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. And his father was like, I mean, because they live in Foxborough, they're yeah. like generations of. And his father was like, "That's not scribble. That's yeah. not scribble. That's not scribble." And you, my nephew, just Kids the are joy. So funny. And, but how generous! I thought LB was going to get me like a little picture signed, and he yeah. gives me this beautiful. I mean, that's great. I love him. He's from Boston. People from Boston are generous. All right. So let's say the name of the show and do your Twitter. Quick Pitch. Quick yes. Pitch. And it's on. Quick Pitch is on MLB Network. Uh, it comes on typically at 1 a.m. Eastern, although tonight we're on at 11. Um, but basically we come on when all the games are winding down, the West Coast games. Um, and, and it airs all night and all morning. So we've got uh, like highlights from every single game. Um, we've got some analysis. We've got sound. Like If you missed anything in the world of baseball, we've got it summed up in an hour for you all because across the league. Because Heidi did it. She wrote it on the side and put it together for you. <laughs> now and, they know. And a great team of people. Yes, but it, yeah, and it's a great show. Even my dad. My dad's like, I really like this show. He goes, when you did the Red Sox games, I had to watch a, you know, a four-hour baseball game to see you for 30 seconds. He's like, but this is like, it's a fast pace, and you get all the highlights and it's a it's a great show it's on mlb network also you can follow me on twitter as you yes. were saying at heidi watney um and yeah it's it's fun if you like baseball come along for the ride no and also you know it's cool you started off saying you wanted to be an actress and now you have the whole hour show and it's kind of all come around yeah yeah Cool. Someday, someday I'm going to be in one of your movies. I'm going to have you. You'll be my sidekick. I'm going to have a yeah. new sitcom about me being a sports room. With the thing in Learning my ear. <laughs> with the thing in my ear. And you'll be like, Sue, you could be my producer. All my so friends tell me I should be a reality show. <laughs> no, that's really funny. I was thinking as we were doing this, I'm like, somebody might listen to this and go, that's a really good idea. Because you never see it that way. You yeah. always see, because women in the sports and everything, they always think, oh, can they do it? Can they do They're so busy questioning it instead of being like, yeah, they're doing it. Yeah. They're doing it, and Heidi, I just have to say, you are awesome. Awesome. I was going to say, I was thinking we have to say, send more love to Boston, and I said, awesome. Let's send a little more love to Boston to everybody up there, because this is going to go drop next Wednesday, and uh, we're sending hugs to everybody. Heidi Watney, everybody, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Sue. My pleasure.